Section 2 of Poems by Currer, Ellis, and Acton Bell by Charlotte, Emily, and Anne Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. Mementos by Charlotte Bronte. Arranging long locked drawers and shelves of cabinets shut up for years, what a strange task we've set ourselves! How still the lonely room appears! How strange this mass of ancient treasures, mementos of past pains and pleasures, these volumes clasped with costly stone, with print all faded, gilding gone, these fans of leaves from Indian trees, these crimson shells from Indian seas, these tiny portraits set in rings, once doubtless seemed such precious things. Keepsakes bestowed by love on faith, and worn till the receiver's death, now stored with cameos, china, shells, in this old closet's dusty cells. I scarcely think for ten long years a hand has touched these relics old, and coating each slow-formed appears the growth of green and antique mould. All in this house is mossing over, all is unused and dim and damp nor light nor warmth the rooms discover, bereft for years of fire and lamp. The sun, sometimes in summer, enters the casements with reviving ray, but the long rains of many winters moulder the very walls away. And outside all is ivy, clinging to chimney, lattice, gable grey, scarcely one little red rose springing through the green moss can force its way. Unscarred, the daw and starling nestle where the tall turret rises high, and winds alone come near to rustle the thick leaves where their cradles lie. I sometimes think when late at even I climb the stair reluctantly, some shape that should be well in heaven or ill elsewhere will pass by me. I fear to see the very faces familiar thirty years ago, even in the old accustomed places, which look so cold and gloomy now. I've come to close the window hither at twilight when the sun was down, and fear my very soul would wither, lest something should be dimly shown, too much the buried form resembling of her who once was mistress here, lest doubtful shade or moonbeam trembling might take her aspect once so dear. Hers was this chamber, in her time it seemed to me a pleasant room, for then no cloud of grief or crime had cursed it with a settled gloom. I had not seen death's image laid in shroud and sheet on yonder bed. Before she married she was blessed, blessed in her youth, blessed in her worth. Her mind was calm, its sunny rest shone in her eyes more clear than mirth. And when attired in rich array, light, lustrous hair about her brow, she yonder sat, a kind of day lit up what seemed so gloomy now. These grim oak walls even then were grim, that old carved chair was then antique, but what around looked dusk and dim served as foil to her fresh cheek. Her neck and arms of hue so fair, eyes of unclouded smiling light, her soft and curled and floating hair, gems and attire as rainbow bright. Reclined in yonder deep recess, oft time she would at evening lie, watching the sun she seemed to bless with happy glance the glorious sky. She loved such scenes, and as she gazed her face evinced her spirit's mood, beauty or grandeur ever raised in her a deep-felt gratitude. But of all lovely things she loved a cloudless moon on summer night, full oft have I impatient proved to see how long her still delight would find a theme in reverie, out on the lawn, or where the trees let in the lustre fitfully, as their boughs parted momently to the soft, languid summer breeze. Alas, that ere she should have flung those pure, though lonely joys away, Deceived by false and guileful tongue, she gave her hand, then suffered wrong. Oppressed, ill-used, she faded young, and died of grief by slow decay. 
open that casket. Look how bright those jewels flash upon the sight. The brilliance have not lost a ray of luster since her wedding day. But see, upon that pearly chain, how dim lies time's discoloring stain. I've seen that by her daughter worn, for ere she died a child was born, a child that ne'er its mother knew, that lone and almost friendless grew. For ever when its step drew nigh, averted was the father's eye. And then a life impure and wild made him a stranger to his child. Absorbed in vice, he little cared on what she did or how she fared. The love withheld she never sought. She grew uncherished, learnt untaught. To her the inward life of thought full soon was open laid. I know not if her friendlessness did sometimes on her spirit press, but plaint she never made. The bookshelves were her darling treasure. She rarely seemed the time to measure while she could read alone. And she, too, loved the twilight wood, and often, in her mother's mood, away to yonder hill would hie, like her, to watch the setting sun, or see the stars born one by one, out of the darkening sky. Nor would she leave that hill till night, trembled from pole to pole with light. Even then, upon her homeward way, long, long her wandering steps delayed, to quit the sombre forest shade through which her eerie pathway lay. You ask if she had beauty's grace, I know not, but a nobler face my eyes have seldom seen, a keen and fine intelligence, and better still, the truest sense were in her speaking mean. But bloom or luster was there none. Only at moments fitful shone an ardor in her eye that kindled on her cheek a flush, warm as red skies passing blush, and quick with energy. Her speech, too, was not common speech. No wish to shine or aim to teach was in her words displayed. She still began with quiet sense, but oft the force of eloquence came to her lips in aid. Language and voice unconscious changed, and thoughts in other words arranged, her fervid soul transfused into the hearts of those who heard, and transient strength and ardor stirred in minds to strength unused. Yet in the gay crowd or festal glare, grave and retiring was her air. T'was seldom, save with me alone, that fire of feeling freely shone. She loved not awes nor wonders gaze, nor even exaggerated praise, nor even notice if too keen the curious gazer searched her mien. Nature's own green expanse revealed the world the pleasure she could prize, on free hillside, in sunny field, in quiet spots by woods concealed, grew wild and fresh her chosen joys. Yet nature's feelings deeply lay in that endowed and youthful frame, shrined in her heart and hid from day, they burned unseen with silent flame. In youth's first search for mental light, she lived but to reflect and learn. But soon her mind's maturer might for stronger task did pant and yearn, and stronger task did fate assign, task that a giant's strength might strain, to suffer long and ne'er repine, be calm in frenzy, smile at pain. Pale with the secret war of feeling, sustained with courage, mute yet high, the wounds at which she bled revealing only by altered cheek and eye. She bore in silence, but when passion surged her soul with ceaseless foam, the storm at last brought desolation, and drove her exiled from her home. And silent still she straight assembled the wrecks of strength her soul retained, for though the wasted body trembled, the unconquered mind to quail disdained. She crossed the sea, now alone she wanders by Seine's or Rhine's or Arno's flow. Fain would I know if distance renders relief or comfort to her woe. Fain would I know if henceforth ever these eyes shall read in hers again that light of love which faded never, though dimmed so long with secret pain. 
She will return, but cold and altered, Like all whose hopes too soon depart, Like all on whom have beat unsheltered The bitter blasts that blight the heart. No more shall I behold her lying Calm on pillow, smoothed by me, no more that spirit, worn with sighing, Will know the rest of infancy. If still the paths of lore she follow, T'will be with tired and goaded will. She'll only toil the aching hollow, The joyless blank of life to fill. And, oh, full oft, quite spent and weary, Her hand will pause, her head decline. That labor seems so hard and dreary, on which no ray of hope may shine. Thus the pale blight of time and sorrow Will shade with grey her soft dark hair. Then comes the day that knows no morrow, And death succeeds to long despair. So speaks experience, sage and hoary, I see it plainly, know it well, Like one who having read a story Each incident therein can tell. Touch not that ring, for twas his, the sire of that forsaken child, and not his relics can inspire, save memories, sin defiled. I, who sat by his wife's deathbed, I, who his daughter loved, could almost curse the guilty dead, for woes the guiltless proved. And heaven did curse, they found him laid when crime for wrath was rife, Cold, with a suicidal blade, clutched in his desperate gripe. T'was near that long deserted hut, which in the wood decays, Death's axe, self-wielded, struck his root, and lopped his desperate days. You know the spot, where three black trees lift up their branches fell, And moaning, ceaseless as the seas, still seem in every passing breeze The deed of blood to tell. They named him mad, and laid his bones where holier ashes lie. Yet doubt not that his spirit groans in hell's eternity. But lo, night closing o'er the earth infects our thoughts with gloom. Come, let us strive to rally mirth, where glows a clear and tranquil hearth in some more cheerful room. End of section 2